Thanks, Cesar, for the invitation on Sage. So he's a classic example of careful what you publish, right? <laughs> Uh, so yeah, publish on firing ostomy tubes, and it's like the third talk I have to give on firing ostomies. <laughs> most patient, most people expect you know an old guy and they're about to retire talking about firing ostomy, so that, that's probably how they see me now. Uh, but I'm, I'll just explain my uh, experience with firing ostomies and talk a little bit about um, its complications. Uh, I don't have any disclosures for this talk. So just to go be on the same page, firing ostomy, it's a surgical formation of an artificial opening into the pharynx. Uh, in other ways, it's a, any tube that enters the skin through a small incision in the neck, usually on the left side, and then the tube is, enters the esophagus through the pharynx and is delivered into the stomach. If we Pictionary, you can use really any tube, but this is what I used. I used a 16 to 18 French 50 inch Levine tube. Uh, but you can use really anything you want. I would suggest avoiding the hard nasogastric tubes because those can be very uncomfortable. This is very soft and pliable and patients really don't hurt much with it. We won't go over the advantages of using enteral access, but we've talked about long-term nasogastric tube complications. We've talked about uncomfortable, the dysphagia, decreased saliva production, impede uh, speech, swallow physiology, they induce coughing, and they keep the UES open, right? You never see a patient like this, right? It's mostly someone like this who's miserable and like, is this over? Um, so we've talked about uh, Back complications, but nasogastric tubes by themselves have a lot of complications, both immediate and chronic. Immediate complications, you have epistaxis, both turbinate and septum trauma or fractures. You can intubate the trachea and bronchi. Uh, perforation, vomiting, and aspiration for the immediate complications. And chronic, we see sinusitis, ailer and skin necrosis, uh, nasal septum erosions, abscesses, esophageal strictures, laryngeal edema, ulcerations, obstructions. So nasogastric tubes are not benign either and patients hate them. That, I haven't seen a happy patient with a nasogastric tube. So pharyngostomy tubes, when would you consider using a pharyngostomy tube? It's usually a someone who you expect they're gonna have prolonged need of nasogastric decompression. Or you can use it for long-term enteral feedings, or you can use it post operatively for drainage or decompression. I've also used it for drainage of contained mediastinal perforations. So, they're a good alternative to long-term nasogastric tubes. They can be used for decompression with intestinal obstruction or inoperable abdomens, as Eric pointed out. Um, helpful for enteral feedings where a percutaneous approach is not possible or either an IR approach is not possible. And they can be used uh, you know, as decompressive and esophagectomy if you're gonna keep an NG for a week or longer, conduit decompression and therapeutically for, not, for anastomotic leaks or contained perforations, but that's another talk. So this is the anatomy you're gonna see. So you're gonna use your uh, anesthesiologist uh, laryngoscope. You can use either use a regular Miller laryngoscope or use a CMAC. This is what you're gonna see. And you're looking for two, two things here. You're looking at the uvula, but then you're gonna find the anterior tonsillar pillar and the posterior tonsillar pillar. And that's where you wanna actually focus on. So behind the posterior tonsillar pillar, that's the area where the pharyngostomy is gonna go. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the technique in a minute. So. In the neck, there's an avascular triangle that's bordered by anteriorly, superiorly by the hyoid bone, medially by the thyrocartilage, and laterally by the jugular carotid axis. And that little triangle is avascular. There's really no structures there. It's just a thin layer uh, of neck skin, really. There's nothing in there. Uh, and when we do it, we put our laryngoscope, we turn the room lights down, and we transilluminate through that triangle and we don't we make sure there's no structures in there uh, once you do that then you put a long we use a uh, MD clamp or you can use a long uh, tonsil or something like that and you insinuate that triangle from the inside of the mouth uh, and then you feel it in, in the neck and the outside with your finger and when you see that you put your clamp behind the left left uh, uh, behind the posterior tonsillar pillar in that triangle, and then you feel it on the outside. You make a small neck incision, and then you can you can uh, you know puncture the skin. 
So and there's two ways. If you're just going to put a firing awesome straight for decompression, you can do that. And, uh, and then once you have your clamp out, you just, you just feed it into the mouth, and you can either just advance it blindly or endoscopically. Then the other thing is if you want to specifically place it into a perforation or something, what we do is it's a retrograde technique. So you bring your scope, put your wire into the, the perforation, take your scope out, leave the wire. Then bring your uh, Levine tube into the perforation, and now you have it through the mouth. So what we do is now we advance first a, a, a soft NG through this firing ostomy technique, then we suture in the mouth the soft NG to the firing ostomy and then pull it back. And this is how the patient looks like. They're long tubes, we coil it in the chest and, and that's how we secure it so that they cannot be pulled out. And on the last picture on the right, you'll see it looks almost like a central line and I'll talk about why it looks like that in a minute. So, in a, two examples. So in a case you have a patient with a esophagectomy, comes back with failure to thrive, needs enteral axis, you have a lot of options, right? This is not the patient you, you know, the first patient you're going to think about. But this is another patient I saw, a 61-year-old female, had a redo parasophageal hernia, went bad outside hospital, multiple previous laparotomies, someone tried like a, tried another repair, fascial dehiscence, open abdomen, skin grafts, TPN, you know, and they ask you to put, a, to, to put an axis, and she's going to need it for a long time. So, you know, 34 kilos, malnourished. So what are your options? So you're really running out of options. I think firing ostomy tubes or something like that may, may be something that's adequate. Um, any tube, as we said, can have a lot of complications. Anything that goes through the nose uh, can have complications and the patient's discomfort. So my experience with firing ostomy is, is, is a few more, but this is what I published. Um, 84 patients uh, that we put firing ostomies in. 60% was for, mostly for esophageal cancers, decompression. Um, 14 for transluminal drainage of contained esophageal perforations. And for about 10% for endolone nutrition. The mean time for removal was about 18 days, but we had patients that at the time of publishing still had it, and it was about almost half a year. And there's about 11% complication risk. And most of it was um, the early experience. So the 11% complication, 8% 8 8 was localized cellulitis, all resolved with IV antibiotics. 2% uh, had a superficial abscess that required removal of the firing ostomy tube and bedside drainage of that abscess. And we had one acute uh, pharyngeal bleeding. That was actually after 19 days after placement and removal of the tube. The patient came back with massive um, bleeding, vomiting blood, and we had to go to IR. They embolized the le a left ascending pharyngeal branch of the external carotid artery. Uh, so the early experience with, the, with those complications led to think that cellulite is the most common. So we started thinking, what can we do about it? And what won't put a lot of burden on our nursing staff? So we said, well, they already take care of central lines. They know how to do that. So let's treat it like a central line. So we started uh, putting bio patches uh, on doing dressing changes. And we asked the patients to do gargles with a chlorhexidine mouth gargle. And that pretty much eliminated all the superficial abscesses. And, um, and also important, we compared our 66% uh, of our patients with firing ostomies had the formal swallow evaluations. And their rate of dysphagia and aspiration was about the same as any patient with a nasogastric tube. So it doesn't really change that, uh, but they're definitely more comfortable. And for, for bleeding, we modified the technique. Before, we didn't use to transilluminate. Now we, we transilluminate every single time to make sure there's not a branch or anything that you're going to put your tube through. Uh, and again, if, if you are... Uh, Finding your landmarks correctly and you uh, follow the steps, uh, it, it's, it's actually a very, fairly simple procedure. So in conclusion, I think they're well tolerated by patients, far better than a nasogastric tube. And you can use it for many things. You know, you could prefer the decompression, feeding, drainage of collections. Um, and it's a simple technique. It's really easy to learn and has a low complication rate. And I think they should remain active in the practice of general and thoracic surgeons. And they're not just a relic that you want to hear, like, you know, closing the fascia with wire or something like that. Um, I'll take any questions later. Thank you.